This talk is entitled Giant Eyes and Ancient Skies. And the idea here is to look at how uh, telescope technology has developed um, over the past 400 years and where we might be going into in the future. Okay, so let me flash back 400 years to what astronomers would have looked like uh, in around the 1600s. This is an image of, uh, a modern day image of Galileo looking through one of the first telescopes ever made. And he was the first person to see the night sky through a telescope. And this is how his telescope would have looked. So you can see it uh, looks a little homemade. Uh, it's mostly made of wood and leather and uh, very important pieces of glass at either end. And that's what made this from a, from a long wooden tube into a telescope that could make astronomical measurements. So why do we need a telescope? What's the importance of having this telescope? Well, here's a, a zoomed in picture of a human eye and all the light that we see comes through the central black part of the eye, um, which we call the pupil. And our pupil is around five millimeters in diameter. And that's all, all the light that we see comes in through this little hole in our eyes. Now, if we compare this with Galileo's telescope, we can see that um, the diameter of the, the front of the telescope, the lens that catches the light, is significantly bigger than the pupil of the human eye. And that difference uh, means that we can collect a lot more light. So the bigger the area of the lens of the telescope, then uh, the more light that you can get. And the more light you get, the fainter objects you can see, you can see things that are further away, and you can see things in more detail. And that was the important advance that the telescope gave uh, scientists 400 years ago. Now, what did Galileo do with this telescope? Well, he made some of the most important um, observations that humans had ever made, and some of the first ones. So he was the first person to see that the craters on the moon were really craters. It was a, a, a three-dimensional object, it wasn't a perfect sphere. He could see long shadows and these impacts that obviously needed some kind of explanation. He made some uh, revolutionary observations of planets in the night sky. Uh, these were originally thought to be wandering stars. People, the scientists knew that the, they didn't follow the same track as the stars, but so they thought they were some kind of special star. When Galileo looked through his telescope, he could see that they weren't stars at all, but they were actually disks of light on the, on the sky. Um, and they had peculiar features like the rings around Saturn, and you could see that Venus had phase, phases, so changing phases a bit like our moon has, has, which again needed explanation. He made the first observations of Jupiter's moons, so you could see that there were these small specks of light that were going around Jupiter, and that seemed to cycle around Jupiter from night to night. And over long periods, you could see that they were orbiting around Jupiter, just like the moon orbits around Earth. So these were really fundamental in changing our perspective on where Earth is in the universe. The Earth is not the center of the universe. It was actually one of a bunch of celestial bodies that obey the laws uh, of nature. So here we can see a diagram uh, showing the layout of how Galileo's telescope would have looked. So you have at the front, you have the objective lens, this big lens uh, on the left, and that's where the light comes in. And the job of the lens is basically to bend the light and bring it towards our eye. But you need a second piece of glass, which is, has a different shape, a concave shape, which is the eyepiece. And that's what redirects the light in such a way that our eye can see a nice sharp image. So that's the basic layout of a Galilean telescope. Um, the trouble is that if you follow this design, it makes for something that's quite unwieldy and large. So here I'm showing you a picture. Uh, obviously, it's easy to use because you have some kids using it. But it looks a little clumsy and awkward. Um, to point accurately at the sky, and it's amazing that Galileo actually managed to make the observations that he did, uh, considering how difficult it is to use this kind of telescope. Now, the bigger the telescope, the more light we get, and, and the further away are the things that we can see. So, ideally, we want to make this even bigger, right? Bigger is better in this case. So here is one of the largest refracting telescopes, so following roughly the idea of Galileo's telescope with glass lenses. This is one of the largest ones that was ever built. This is the Yerkes Observatory in the USA. It's referred to as the 40-inch telescope, so in metric that's around a meter diameter. And that refers to the size of the lens at the front of the telescope. So this is like having a one meter eyeball, basically. So this is a very powerful telescope um, in its time, but you can see that it's absolutely enormous. 
So there's actually a person standing at the, on the floor of the dome here looking at the telescope. And I'll show you some more pictures. So this a person standing next to this giant lens at the front end of the telescope. So that's the one meter lens, and that's roughly a, as big as you can make a lens um, without it actually collapsing under its own weight, because you can only hold the lens at the edges. And that makes, uh, makes it hard to actually support the lens, um, and you need to make it out of glass, and that's not the strongest of substances. So if you go much larger than this, the lens will actually break, and you won't be able to hold it around the edges anymore. I'll just show you, show you some more pictures. This is then looking in the eyepiece. So you see that giant big lens has to bring the beam of light down to something that your eye can actually digest at the other end. And here you see the astronomer looking into the eyepiece of, of this giant telescope. And another picture just to show you just how enormously large this, uh, this structure is. You also have to put it in a dome. And if you're going to make uh, the telescope larger, then the entire building has to get bigger as well. And so things just become prohibitively expensive to make and, and difficult. So the first telescope to get around this problem uh, is referred to as the Leviathan of Parsonstown, Parsonstown which is a, a very grand name. This was built by Lord Rossi, who was a, a rich uh, baron in the late 1800s. And here's a modern day picture. This telescope still stands today, and it looks more like a castle than, than a telescope. And inside you have this uh, large tube, and inside this tube was a 1.8 meter optic that gathered the most light that any telescope had ever gathered before. And important observations were made with this telescope as well. This is a, a hand-drawn image by Lord Rossi of the M51 or Whirlpool galaxy. Because they didn't have sensitive cameras in those days, so all the recordings had to be made basically by drawing what the astronomer would see. So the real innovation of this telescope was that it didn't use glass optics, it used a mirror. And this is a picture of one of the mirrors from the Leviathan Telescope. It's 1.8 meters in diameter, and it's made of metal. So this thing is solid metal, and it's polished. Polished so well that it reflects about 60% of the light that falls on it. So these are pretty heavy. These are three-ton uh, pieces of metal. Um, and the metal also got rusty very quickly. It tarnished very quickly. So he had two of them, and he could switch one out. While one was being cleaned, he would use the other one, and so on. So every couple of months, they would have to move this three-ton piece of metal in and out of the telescope. So I guess these were the people that worked for Lord, Lord Rossi looking after the, the telescope mirror. So how can a mirror replace the glass optic? Well, here's a little diagram. So on the top, I show uh, one of these con convex lenses. And below, we show a mirror. And the gray regions are showing where the piece of optics is supported. So you see the lens has to be held at the edges, where the, where the lens is actually at its thinnest point. Whereas the mirror, well, it's reflecting all the light back, so it can be supported all the way across the back, which is much easier. And as I said, what the lens does is it bends the light and brings it to a focus, and that's how we can get an image out of it. Well, a mirror basically does the same. It bends the light, it changes the path of the light, and allows us to control where the light goes um, in order to create a nice image. So you can see that the mirror actually does pretty much the same job as the lens, but it's much easier to make it very, very large. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind modern telescope technology. But if you want to find really, really large telescopes uh, today, you have to go to very awful places, uh, very hostile, difficult to, to, to survive places like this. So this is uh, an image of the island of Hawaii. And uh, of course, all the tourists go to the beach, but the astronomers have to go to the mountaintop, which is up here, covered in snow, with very little oxygen, um, and these little white dots that you see on the top of the mountain, those are giant telescope domes that are roughly over four kilometers high in the sky at the top of this mountain called Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So while everyone's having a nice time on the beach, the astronomers are stuck up on the top of this mountain. But it's actually a beautiful place. Here's a, a zoom in, if you like, an up close image of the telescopes on top of Mauna Kea. And this is them just after sunset, uh, waiting to start observing the night sky. And this is just two of the telescopes up there. There's roughly uh, 12 observatories up there. Um, and they're all pretty enormous. <clears throat> so to give you an idea of how large these telescopes are, I'll show you a person on one for scale. So here I've, I've put a person inside the dome of the telescope, so you can see how big the telescope is. I'm not sure if you can see the person, so I'll, I'll zoom in uh, a little bit so that you can 
you can see the person waving at us from inside the dome. Okay, so hopefully you can see somebody with his hand in the air waving back at us. And that gives you a sense of how enormous these buildings are. They, they're really huge. And he's standing uh, inside these shutters which open and close. These are big air vents that let the air flow through the telescope um, and give us nice airflow of the telescope that allows us to take nice images. Here's another one. You see two guys standing on the top of the dome here. I uh, bet you get, 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 you get a, a really good view from up there. Um, but you can see this is really like a, a cathedral-sized building, except this has to move around and allow a telescope to see the sky and uh, open and close and do all kinds of complex things every, every day. So this is a picture of what's inside this giant dome. This is the Gemini 8-meter telescope. And uh, this is me actually with my mum standing next to the telescope. She was visiting uh, me when I lived there and uh, I took her up to see the telescope. And you can see that we're, we're actually quite small in comparison to this big telescope. The big circular thing in the middle of this image, it looks almost like a hole, but that's actually a reflective mirror. And it's such a perfect reflector that you can, it, it almost looks like nothing is there, but it's actually reflecting light from, from above. So how do you make such an enormous mirror? Well, it's actually quite a, a complex process. So it starts with a giant oven. And this is a picture of an empty oven getting ready to make one of these giant mirrors. Uh, so they prepare this area and then they line it with uh, a number of hexagonal um, pieces uh, of material that are going to form like a honeycomb structure. That's actually going to give the mirror all its strength. So the glass is strong, but it's not strong enough really to support its weight, even with the metal structure behind. So you have to kind of build in a honeycomb of ceramic uh, blocks to kind of give it strength. So that's the first thing. And every one of these blocks is basically an individual. So they have to be put in exactly the right place in exactly the right way uh, by hand. So it's, it's quite a, a complex process. So that's the base. And next comes the glass. So the mirror is made of glass, but not just any glass. This has to be very high quality, pure glass. And it's not made of one big chunk of glass. It, they actually start off as pieces of glass. And here you see one block held in someone's hand. So it takes many, many of these blocks uh, to make the full mirror. And these have to be placed carefully by hand, one layer thick inside this big oven on top of these hexagonal ceramic blocks. So that takes a long time. In total, there'll be about 20 tons of glass put down here. So that's a, a rather a, a lot of glass to control and to, to, um, to work with. So here we see the, the finished pro product almost. So all of the chunks of glass have been laid down now carefully. And they're just undergoing a final inspection before they crank up the oven and start baking the glass to make the final mirror. So it's a very special kind of oven. You can see that it's circular, and this is the lid just going down, um, which is going to close and keep, keep out all the heat in while this thing is, is uh, heated up to around 1,000 degrees centigrade. But it's a very special oven. Um, and the reason that it's special is that it actually moves. So in this picture, you can see that the oven looks kind of blurry, and that's because the oven is spinning around. And I'm going to try to play a movie here to show you this giant oven spinning around in action. So hopefully this will work, and you'll see this large red structure spinning around and around and around. So inside there is the 20 tons of glass at 1,000 degrees centigrade, um, undergoing the process that's going to make this giant mirror. So the reason that everybody seems quite relaxed there with this giant thing spinning around the background is that it actually has to spin around and stay warm for a very long time. It can take up to six months for the glass to be melted and then finally cool down. But we can see what's going on inside in this little movie here. This is a camera that's been put inside the oven. And you can see that it's, you start off with these chunks of glass. And then hopefully you can see them start to liquefy as they get hot. And it turns into a liquid glass. And it runs into all the little cracks and crevices and forms a smooth surface. And then eventually it cools down as they sort of bring down the temperature slowly, slowly, slowly they bring down the temperature. And this giant surface of glass will solidify into a single uh, solid piece of glass that's roughly you know, eight meters across and has a very uh, precise shape. But why is it spinning? Well, the reason it's spinning is because we don't want a flat piece of glass. We actually want the glass to be curved at the end. And we could spend a lot of time kind of 
polishing and grinding away the glass, but if we spin the glass as it cools, it'll actually form a curved shape naturally in the process. And that saves a lot of work and a lot of time. And now you see the glass melting. It's kind of neat to watch. Okay, so here's the finished product uh, with someone standing or sitting in the middle, so you can sort of see how large this is. It's pretty transparent, so you're actually looking through the glass and you see the honeycomb structure behind. And that glass has a, a very high optical quality, it has a very precise shape, it's very smooth, but it's still not precise enough. So that's just the first step. The next step is to polish the glass. So I said we spin it to get, to get a shape, but that shape is not quite precise enough. And to get that precise shape, we put it into this machine, which has a, a circular pad that kind of rotates and spins around and grinds away on that surface. Um, it has to be extremely precise. They're looking for surface defects at the level of nanometers. So that's a billionth of a meter, which is kind of a hard concept to think about. Um, but one way to think about it is if this mirror was stretched out to be the size of Australia, the highest mountain that would be allowed would be one centimeter tall. Right? So that's to give you an idea of the level of precision that the surface of the glass has to be polished to. Very difficult. And the way that they do this is that they grind a little bit away and then they measure it. And then they grind a bit more and they measure and they grind and they measure and they go through this process of checking and re-polishing and checking again over the course of 18 months or maybe two years is how long it takes to get the shape to be the level of precision that's needed to make the telescope. So this is a very time consuming and high precision process. Then the last part is to coat the mirror. So you'll know that a mirror is not just a piece of glass. You have to have something shiny like a silver paint or something on one side in order to make it reflective. So how do we make the mirror, this giant piece of glass, how do we make it shiny? Well, we have to stick it into this giant big hamburger bun looking thing. Uh, this is called a coating chamber. And it has to be large enough to fit that piece of glass inside. And that is what's gonna be used to put down a very thin layer of metal that's going to act as the reflective surface. And by very thin, I mean sort of uh, a few nanometers thick. So extremely thin, very fragile actually. But after that process has happened, you end up with what we can recognize now as a mirror. We have a large circular surface that's reflecting the light that's falling on it. And that is how we make one of these giant telescope mirrors. Okay. And here's a picture of the finished product. This is, uh, again, the Gemini telescope in Hawaii. And here it is sitting inside the dome, getting ready to observe the stars. It's heated through electricity. Um, so you just have electrical coils, um, a bit like your oven at home, except a lot bigger, uh, a lot more powerful, and it spins around. But it's basically using the same fuel source. So that's great. We've come a long way in 400 years, and this is a diagram that shows how the size or the area, in fact, of telescopes has increased over time. So on the bottom left, you have Galileo's telescope, which was small. It had a, an aperture that was around the size of a dollar coin. And then over the past 400 years, the telescopes have gotten gradually bigger and bigger and bigger, and now you see Gemini is the red dot up at the top right. And that has about the area of, you know, close to the area of a, of a tennis court. So if we want to go even bigger, you know, how are we going to build the next biggest telescopes going forward for the next 400 years? Well, the answer to that question, um, part of the answer lies in these two telescopes here. These are the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, and they're a bit special. They use a different kind of technology to, to form their giant mirror. Rather than making one single giant big mirror, it's made up of uh, smaller hexagonal pieces. Those pieces are a bit easier to make, and you can start tiling them together and in principle, you can tile and tile and tile and make pretty large surfaces from these small pieces. And that idea is how we're going to go forward to make the next largest telescopes. And I'm going to walk you through some of the current ideas. This first one is the Giant Magellan Telescope. So it takes uh, these large 8 meter mirrors and puts several of those together. So you have seven in total. And they work together as one. So they'll bring the light together and it's like having an even larger telescope. And this one's going to be built over the next five years or so in the mountains of Chile. And Australia is actually helping uh, to pay for and build this telescope and, and build instruments that are going to look through it. Um, and there's a, a, an, an impression of how it will look on top of the mountain in Chile. But it's not the only one. 
So I'll tell you, firstly, this is how it compares to the Keck. So on the left, we have the current Keck telescope with these small hexagonal pieces. And you can see that the Giant Magellan Telescope, the GMT, is going to have a much larger collecting area. So again, we're increasing our area, collecting more light. There's also the 30 meter telescope that's going to be in Hawaii and it's using more like the Keck idea with these small hexagonal pieces. And this is showing you again the footprint of the, the large mirror and, and uh, how much larger that area is going to be. That's going to translate into more light and being able to see even fainter objects. And finally we have the European Extremely Large Telescope. It's not a very creative name but that's what they're calling it. Um, and this is again going to be built in Chile by a European consortium, European led consortium. And it's truly enormous. So it's going to be almost 40 meters in diameter. And it's again going to be made of these hexagonal pieces all put together. And it's going to be the largest of these future planned optical telescopes to exist. So that's going to be pretty exciting. So here's a, a kind of overview of all the different optical telescopes that exist and all their different primary mirrors. And uh, some of the most special ones are not the largest ones. And I'll just draw your attention to two that are sitting down in the corner here the James Webb Space Telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope. These are not the largest telescopes, but they have a really special location. And here's the Hubble Space Telescope in its orbit above Earth. It's only 2.4 meters, so it's significantly smaller than the Gemini Telescope that I showed you earlier. But because it's in space, it doesn't have the distortions that are caused by Earth's atmosphere. And that lets it take really amazing images. So here is the hand-drawn image of the Whirlpool Galaxy from Lord Ross's telescope. So this is how it looks from Earth with a 2 meter telescope, it looks kind of fuzzy. How Hubble sees that galaxy is more like this. So you see amazing levels of detail, you see star formation regions, dust clouds, these beautiful spiral arms coming into the center. It's rich with information and that's largely because it doesn't have the Earth's atmosphere making everything blurry and twinkly. So from space you get this amazingly clear view. And it's taken uh, this image here, which is one of the most sensitive images ever taken. Almost every source that you see in this image is a galaxy of around a billion stars. So every speck of light is a galaxy of 10 billion stars. That's pretty amazing. And images like this are only possible from space um, and really revolutionize our understanding of the universe. Next up will be the James Webb Space Telescope. It should be launched in the next few years. Uh, they're still building it and finishing it off and here you see part of the mirror being assembled um, in the laboratory where they test these mirrors with somebody standing in front of it and it has these special gold plated mirrors that's um, important for the kind of light that it's going to reflect. It's so big that it doesn't fit inside a rocket so they actually have to fold it up in order to put it into space. Um, th that's just to show you how large that mirror is going to be. Um, compared to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is, the Hubble was basically the biggest one that would fit inside a rocket at that time. James Webb is going to go even bigger and they have to fold it up to put it into space. And I'll just try and show you a little movie here of them unfolding it. It has a big sun shield that's about the size of a tennis court that's going to block out light from the sun. And then the telescope kind of unfolds itself. Um, it's going to be very far away. All of this is going to happen on the other side of the moon. And it's in a place where we can't really go there to fix things when they go wrong. So all of this has to work very precisely without fail. Um, and we'll see how well it works in a few years' time. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about me. How did I get here? How did I become an astronomer? You can probably tell already from my accent, I'm not from Australia. Um, I'm from Scotland in, in the United Kingdom. And I went to high school uh, just outside Glasgow, which is you know, roughly here on the map. And after high school, I went to university in a small town called St Andrews on the other side of my country, um, which isn't very far away by Australian standards. Um, and after my degree, I went to do a PhD at the University of Durham in England. And it took three years. After that, I went off to uh, the Netherlands to do what you call a postdoctoral research fellowship. And I was fortunate to be there for five years uh, living in Holland, which was a lot of fun. And after that, I left Europe and went a long way uh, across the world to go live in Hawaii and actually worked at Gemini Observatory for six years in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, which was pretty amazing. And then two years ago I came to Sydney to become uh, a lecturer at Macquarie University and also work for the Australian Astronomical Observatory as part of my job. So that's my pathway. Uh, you can see that astronomy is one of those jobs that, that takes you around the world and you get to live and see a lot of different places. 
if you're thinking about doing astronomy at university, uh, the main subjects that you want to think about are maths, physics, and astronomy. Those are the three core subjects that you would study. But you can also do astronomy together with other degrees in arts or science. Um, I work at Macquarie University where we offer a major named degree in astronomy. Um, and at other universities you can do that or do a major in physics and still be able to take astronomy subjects during your studies. If you do astronomy at university you'll learn in a lot of detail about the things I've been talking about. Telescopes, stars, galaxies, other things like black holes, exotic things like dark matter, or dark energy, cosmology and extrasolar planets. These are the kinds of topics that you'll study if you do astronomy at university. You'll also learn how to use a telescope and take images of your own through, your, uh, through university telescopes. And towards the end of your studies, you'll get to do some kind of research project where you actually, perhaps you'll use a telescope like Gemini, you'll work with researchers and do real new science that no one has ever done before. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about how maths relates to astronomy. Um, maths, it's so inbuilt into doing astronomy that it's hard to actually pick out the specific you know, times that we use math. We just use it all the time. We use it in designing our telescopes. So I show you a diagram here that has algebraic expressions. It uses geometry. If we want to know the distance to the stars, we have to use trigonometry and geometry in order to work those things out. Um, that's a big part of uh, what we do. There's also a lot of mathematics in understanding the information that we collect, these great images that these amazing telescopes take uh, for us. We have to understand those, and that comes in the form of electronic data that has to be understood, usually through the use of mathematical processes. And you might even go as far as to try to simulate the universe um, in a computer. So I'm showing you here a little movie that shows you some blobs forming over time. The, this is a mathematical model of how the universe gets created from the Big Bang till today. So this is using um, mathematics to compute how gas is going to collect under gravity, form stars, release energy, all of this relies on a mathematical prescription for how things work in nature. So math is really important for that. A little bit about jobs, so once you graduate from uh, your astronomy degree, you can go on and do professional research like myself, you might become a university educator, also something that I do. You might work at a, a facility like a telescope in Hawaii or Chile, um, or you might work um, in policy in terms of how science gets done in the country, because science is usually funded by governments and taxpayers, and that needs uh, input from scientists, trained scientists, to work properly. Um, there's also a lot of non-astronomy jobs that you can do. I can just give you a big list here. Um, but the basic idea is that astronomy will give you uh, science training that's broadly applicable in today's world, where you know being um, familiar with dealing with data, having analytic thinking skills, and so on are really crucial. So that's something you can apply to almost uh, in any career path you can think of. And I'll just end with a note to say that you know the future of astronomy, particularly in Australia, is, is very bright. So at the top here you see an image of some radio telescopes. This is out in Western Australia. Australia is leading uh, the development of something called the Square Kilometre Array, uh, which is uh, a set of telescopes that will work together as one. Uh, looking at radio wavelengths, which is um, a different form of light, uh, but still is used heavily in astronomy, uh, and so that's somewhere where Australia is really leading the way. It's also going to be joining in partnership with other countries to build the, the other telescopes that I've talked about, the Giant Magellan Telescope um, and others uh, around the world and beyond the world, uh, like the James Webb Space Telescope. So there'll be lots of new exciting discoveries um, that hopefully you'll all be involved in making one day. So at that, I'll finish up. Thanks a lot for your attention. They're both trying to focus electromagnetic radiation um, down to form some kind of image or a signal that you receive. They both have to have large collecting areas because the signals that they're trying to detect are very weak. Um, and so these are things that they have in common. Basically the shape of a radio telescope follows the same principles as an optical telescope. So you have some kind of dish or you know, sort of a, a parabolic curved surface that's going to focus uh, the radiation to pretty much to a point. I think the most important difference is that whereas with radio telescopes you can make a lot of them and then kind of wire them up together and bring those signals together, that's very hard to do with optical telescopes. Um, and that's largely driven because the wavelength of the radiation 
is a lot smaller with optical light and uh, becomes very difficult to control the signal, um, to record it accurately, um, whereas with radio this basically can be stored electronically um, in a more straightforward way that allows you to bring signals together. The optics don't have to be as precise with radio telescopes, so uh, the surfaces of these white dishes that you can see in the square kilometre array, uh, you can probably walk on those surfaces quite happily with, with your boots on, whereas nobody will ever let you walk with your boots on uh, or any shoes, in fact, on top of an optical telescope because the surface has to be so precisely uh, shaped and formed that it's very delicate. So there are, there are a number of, of practical differences, um, but they are kind of trying to do the same thing. They're trying to detect very, very weak sources of electromagnetic radiation. There are are only a few places on Earth that give you really great conditions for putting your telescope. And the reason that you want to be very careful about where you put your telescope is that they're really, really expensive to make. So these giant telescopes at the bottom of the slide, each of those is roughly a billion dollars each. So you don't want to put it somewhere that it's often rainy and cloudy and there's lots of street lights around and that kind of thing. You want to put it somewhere where, as often as possible, it's going to be looking at a very clear and perfect sky and able to make the precise measurements that astronomers need to make. So, uh, Chile is one of those places. You have the, uh, the Andy, Andes mountain range, which is very often above the clouds, so you don't have to worry about clouds coming and blocking your way. And uh, you're far, often far from any source of light pollution, like big cities. In the northern Andes, uh, you can get far away from uh, sources of light pollution that helps keep the sky dark, uh, which makes life easier. And so, of all the places on Earth, uh, probably the two best places and most popular places are the Chilean Andes and uh, this mountain in Hawaii, uh, Mauna Kea. Those are really the two prime sites for putting giant telescopes because they're so expensive you want such high quality places. I was not one of those kids that had a telescope when I was little um, and I came into astronomy I think it was in high school I, be I became very uh, interested in physics and physics was asking some of these really big questions um, and especially in astronomy you get to ask the questions like you know uh, what's the origins of the universe uh, what trying to understand what the Big Bang means, where we came from, what are the time scales involved. Uh, those questions really appealed to me, uh, I think, basically during the high school uh, years. Um, I think I had the advantage of growing up in a small village, which didn't have much light pollution, and, and I grew up with dogs, and the dogs had to go for a walk every night. And so I, I guess I spent a lot of time going out walking my dog under a nice dark sky and looking at the stars and being pretty fascinated by what might be up there and um, learning more about you know, how the universe worked. And so I think those two things combined, by the time I got to the end of high school, um, going to study astronomy at university seemed like a really good way to get some answers to those questions. Um, and from there, one thing led to another. Uh, at, at university, I really enjoyed the research aspects. It's pretty exciting to, to learn something really new uh, that no one's uh, really thought of or seen or done before um, and that's what you know spurred me on to do a PhD and, uh, and eventually brought me here. There, there can sometimes be one main question that, that makes us develop a certain technology uh, but these telescopes are so powerful and so expensive that we have to make them answer not just one question, but a whole bunch of questions, as many questions as we can think of. And in fact, the, probably the most important questions that these telescopes will answer haven't been thought of yet. Maybe you're going to come up with them. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to be very powerful for looking at faint things and uh, having very high resolution, so looking at very small details. Those are both well-tuned to looking at um, things like the very first galaxies and stars that formed after the Big Bang. 
that's a region of the universe that we really don't know much about and is limited because we can't collect enough light and we can't make sharp enough images. So they're, they're definitely going to make um, big discoveries there. Um, another key area at the moment is looking at planets around other stars. So you probably have learned and read and heard a lot about um, what we call extrasolar planets, so planets going around other stars. That's a very, very difficult measurement to make because stars are so bright and planets are so small and they don't make much light of their own. So it's, uh, and it's right next to this very bright star. So that's a very difficult observation um, that these telescopes will hopefully allow us to start making what we call direct images of planets around other stars on a, a routine basis. And maybe pushing down to things that are a bit like Earth, maybe not exactly like Earth, that's, that's going to take even larger telescopes. But we'll be getting close to understanding in more detail the composition of planets around other stars. And uh, you know, some of those discoveries might indicate um, life of some kind um, or not, and then both outcomes will be very interesting. So those are kind of two um, key science areas that these telescopes are going to go look into. But the truth is that astronomers um, and scientists in general come up with interesting questions all the time, new, new questions to answer. And the point is to make these telescopes as versatile and as powerful as we can so that we have the tools to answer the new questions that come up. In practice, we do this already by looking at the same patch of sky with these different telescopes. And at the moment, we do it at different times. So we'll go look at some patch of sky with the radio telescope. And maybe it shows something interesting, so we'll go and look with an optical telescope and see if that tells us something new. And that's done all the time. What is happening at the moment is uh, astronomers are realizing that the universe isn't as unchanging with time as maybe we like to think. There are very quick phenomena that happen in the universe. Stars explode in very short time scales. There are bursts of energy that come from the universe, and we don't actually know where all of them originate and what the process is that makes them. So in that kind of science, it's really important to, you have to be there at the right time, in the right place of the sky, looking at, at the right time. And so you can do this thing of looking with one telescope and then six months later, uh, or a year later, or more years later, looking with a different telescope. You have to actually look at the same part of the sky at the same time. That is a new field of science that people are starting to explore and uh, using you know, facilities uh, like this telescope out in Western Australia. Uh, so that idea of looking at the same patch of sky at the same time is going to yield, I think, some pretty new and exciting uh, results in terms of stuff that happens very quickly and you have to be very lucky to catch it. So there are lots of things that we can do in space in terms of building telescopes. Um, in fact, it's, it's probably easier to, to build telescopes for outer space and even use them together, join them together, than it would be to do it, for example, on the moon, because the moon is dusty and it has some gravity. So space is a, gr is a great place for putting telescopes. There are some projects which want to link together optical telescopes, which as I told you is, is really difficult to do. They want to uh, link them together to use them sort of as a single telescope, but it's really, really, really hard. Um, basically, these would be telescopes that fly um, on uh, different parts of the Earth's orbit around the sun, so they'd be really far apart. But you need to know exactly where those telescopes are to very, very high levels of precision, like at the wavelength of light precision over you know, something that is millions and millions of kilometers. So that technology is really extremely challenging, but people are thinking about this, they're coming up with ideas. Um, those kinds of telescopes would be the ones that might let us take pictures of um, a planet like Earth going around a, sun -like, a star like the sun. Those would be the kinds of facilities that would allow us to do that. So people are looking at ways to, to, to make you know, multi-telescopes work together in space and have all the benefits of, of those things. But it's just very hard. Technically, you want to, basically at the end of your doctorate, so when you've done your PhD, you are then a, a, a professionally trained um, research scientist in astronomy, and you would then go off and do professional research um, 
and that will take, so you have to do your undergraduate degree, so that can take three or four years, and then you have your PhD, which in this country is typically three years, um, but it can be longer in other countries. So in total, from high school to coming out with a PhD and, and becoming you know, a professional astronomer, um, that can take as little as six years, but it can take much longer, depending on where you are. But you know, you're always learning, so uh, I don't think there's a point at which you, know, you feel like you know everything. Um, one of the great things about working in research is that you, you get to keep learning new things. And uh, yeah, so that, that part never stops. I think, so when I, when I was doing my PhD, it was quite normal for, you know, for me to go to a telescope, observe, use the telescope for a few nights, and observe a handful of galaxies and then go off and analyze them. Um, today we have large data stores, archives that are publicly available, so anyone can go and, and, and access um, data for you know hundreds of thousands of objects in the night sky. So one of the big differences I think will be that um, ability to deal with really huge, enormous amounts of data. Right? So we live in a data-rich world and making new discoveries involves finding some new or unique aspects in amongst an ocean uh, of information. So that, I think, is going to be a big part of doing astronomy in the future, is this sort of big data science. Um, it's a very connected science. So, for example, I talked about planets around other stars. One of the big questions there is, can you, uh, can you find life in these planets around other stars? Well, you know, Physics and astronomy will only get you so far. If you want to understand where life can form, you have to know about biology or chemistry or both. And so that aspect of going between different topics and different subjects, I think will be an important part of doing astronomy in the future. Um, and it's also very interesting. So it's, it's one of the appealing aspects. So I think those are probably the main differences coming up in the near future. The short answer is yes. So every second, uh, the Earth is, is, has a rain of what we call cosmic rays. So these are high energy um, packets of radiation. And they're really hard to stop, right? So you can stop uh, sunlight by you know, putting on some sunglasses or standing under a shade. Uh, cosmic rays can pass through uh, lead. They can pass through buildings. And they can certainly pass through the structure of the telescope. And so on ground-based telescopes, uh, when you take an image, if you open the shutter and take an image where you, you, know, you look at the sky for a long period of time, over time you start to see these small specks appear on your image, and those are the cosmic rays um, hitting your, your detector. And so those are kind of annoying, and it means that we can't um, expose, the camera can't expose for long periods of time. If you're in outer space, it's even worse because you don't have that thick layer of atmosphere that helps to stop some of it and the detectors, the sensitive devices that collect the light on these telescopes, they actually get damaged by these cosmic rays. So, for example, the cameras on the Hubble Space Telescope, um, over time scales of you know, a few years, three years, five years, they start to work less well because of this constant rain of cosmic rays that hit the detector. So they're not fatal, it's not like the telescope will blow up, but it, it works less well and that does limit the time that we can use these devices for. Thanks. <laughs>